Good evening. Here in the public square, we use public sphere theory to understand state and society and everything in between. And there is a lot to understand. History has just turned in the Philippines and the future of the democratic project itself is at stake. Tonight, we focus our attention on one pillar of that project, civil society. I am John Neri, and you are in the public square. It is no secret that the election victory of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. stunned many in civil society. The result was not unexpected, but the outcome, once it became inevitable, plunged many civil society advocates into deepening bouts of denial, anger, depression, and other stages of grief. The post-Marcos Constitution of 1987 helped widen the space for civil society participation, expressly recognizing non-government organizations and people's organizations. Now, that same constitution has led to the election of another Marcos. We can almost feel the wheel of history turning. What role can and should civil society play in the second Marcos administration? Like many crisis conversations going on at the moment, tonight's program will be an attempt to make sense of where we are, where the limits lie, and how the possibilities, starting with the sense of possibility itself, may be found. Our guests are environmental planner Ika Fernandez and accountability advocate Vincent Lazatin. Ika works on spatial data, that is data involving space, for decision-making in transitional and post-crisis situations. She has served as consultant for various international development organizations, national agencies, local governments, and civil society networks. Vince has worked with civil society representatives, including uh, journalists, for almost 20 years as the lead convener of Media Nation. He served as executive director of the Transparency and Accountability Network and is currently national coordinator of Bantay Kita. Good evening, Ika and Vince. Thank you for making time for this. Hello, John. Hi, Ika. So let's start by asking the inevitable question. <laughs> How is civil society coping with the election of Ferdinand Marcos Jr., Ika? Okay, I think we have to start by defining ano ba yung civil society. No? And uh, it's a very contested question. Most people will associate the term with yung mga professional na mga uh, CSOs or NGOs or POs. No? Pero if we're talking about the public sphere, uh, we have to understand it in terms of three sectors, right? Government. The markets and civil society, no, meaning um, everything and everyone working on art, science, uh, religion, media, education, um, even your K-pop stands or Mobile Legends players are civil society, no. So in that sense, everybody has a stake in it, uh, and I think it's not um, it's it's not unusual. It's not fair. It's, it's it's a fair thing to say that everybody, whether it's a CSO or your regular K-pop stan on Twitter, is I think in, at a crossroads right now. You know, uh, in the last few weeks, there have been a lot of crisis conversations trying to imagine what it can, um, what people can do now in this current uh, scenario. You know, because it was not unexpected. Uh, but as you said, you no, know, most CSOs or POs have defined themselves in the last thirty-five years vis-a-vis -vis, um, resistance, no, uh, versus the Marcoses, diba? And then being able to, to reclaim that space and to be productive in a post-Marcos era. So right now, no, uh, to be honest, people are grappling, um, at uh, you know, uh, clutching at straws, trying to find uh, ways to move forward. Some are, siempre, at first with the grief and um, and fear, merong thoughts of withdrawal, but right now, I think some consensus din is, it's now is the time to engage, but the question is, how do you now uh, constructively and powerfully engage in, in such an environment. Thank you. Maybe we can use uh, thick and thin definitions of civil society. Uh, a thin definition may be, you know, referring uh, precisely to those civil society organizations that work in uh, the democratic space. Uh, and the thick definition would include everyone who is not in the markets or in government. Uh, 
for I think most of our program, maybe we can focus on uh, using the thin definition. But you know, anytime you want to widen the discussion and bring in K-pop stands and uh, uh, other uh, forms of life, uh, to use uh, a term from philosophy, uh, that, that would be welcome. So, Vince, uh, the same question to you: How, how, in your view, uh, are the civil society organizations that are or networks that you're part of uh, responding to the victory, to the overwhelming uh, victory of uh, Marcos Jr.? Well, uh, in the networks that I'm, I'm involved with, uh, people are just trying to get their bearings at the moment. Um, the, the victory or the electoral victory of, of Marcos Jr. was not wholly unexpected. Uh, if we follow the survey numbers leading up to the elections, uh, clearly uh, Marcos' victory was, was in the offing. Um, but it's still uh, somewhat shocking to, to actually have it happen in real life. And a lot of the networks that I'm uh, involved with are sort of just trying to get bearing, um, trying to figure out what's up and what's down um, and, and what uh, kinds of space uh, we think that we can still be effective in. Um, there's a lot of fear, of course, that uh, civic space is, is going to narrow even further. Uh, we, we know that we there's been a narrowing of civic space on the, uh, the Duterte administration in the last six years. And uh, there's a feeling that uh, the space will continue to narrow um, or, or, or stay narrow as, as it currently is. So we have to figure out how we go about doing what we need to do in terms of pushing the advocacy, uh, the different advocacies that we, we all support. Um, so we are uh, at various stages of, of uh, grief and Apparently those stages uh, aren't linear. So, so some of us go back and forth between denial and anger and acceptance back to denial and anger. Um, and I find myself uh, sort of uh, ricocheting uh, between those, among those different uh, stages as well. I, I completely agree with you. I don't think uh, the stages of grief are linear at all. Uh, we, might, we, we, we may find ourselves stuck in a loop. Um, I want to ask uh, Ika and then uh, Vince also, um, can we get a little more specific? What are the crisis conversations, the civil society conversations going on right now like? I mean, can we talk about like specific uh, themes or, or, or points that are being raised uh, or belabored uh, at this moment in time? Ika? Okay. Well, I work from, with a large range of groups, no, ranging from those working on the peace process to fiscal reform to, to urban policy. Um, and so, although you know, the, these emotions which Vince mentioned are, are very much present, there's an interesting na common theme then, and I want to share one particular formulation which a friend uh, raised earlier. Um, how do you now make civil society civil again? No, Because um, the old formula of civil society is very i guess i know the babbing assumption is it's it's good no it's mm -hmm. something positive mm -hmm. but the last six years has shown that civil society is not always civil right? you can have good civil society and bad civil society and you can see that in the kind of polarization mm -hmm. uh we're having uh not only online but on the ground no so for example uh although for example uh duterte right? will probably step down with the highest approval rating of any outgoing president, and Marcos has 31 million votes uh, under his belt. No, we have never been so polarized. Um, in the past, in 2016, for example, you had um, the Bardagulan, you had the, the cursing online, but it stayed online. Now, the kind of fraught, even violent relationships are now spilling over uh, in neighborhoods face to face. For example, they're just to share, no. Um, uh, speaking to CSOs working in urban poor areas, one particular person who had volunteered for uh, an opposition candidate uh, shared that because he, she had a tarp no, uh, of a particular color on her um, sa bahay niya, tinapuan ng excrement uh, yung, mm -hmm. yung kanyang bahay. No? Uh, and people I know on the ground in the grassroots organizations no, have been getting threats. So, so you have that kind of tension where uh, the kind of uh, dehumanization and depersonalization you saw uh, in the last six years is probably going to continue, right? Um, whoever is the declared enemy 
uh, whether it's an addict or a communist mm -hmm. or someone who uh, yeah. roots for a different basketball team uh, mm -hmm. will be a target. And that covers not only you know your organized CSOs or POs, but also uh, your regular people on the street, not just you know uh, those who are organized, but our beneficiaries who are uh, your regular uh, ale or uh, uh, kuya, di ba? Uh, doon sa kalsada. So mm -hmm. that in itself is, uh, is a fundamental problem. How do you now do your work, whether it's for uh, education or poverty alleviation uh, in this kind of environment? And there are indications where uh, the kinds of access to both resources and uh, even being able to continue with your jobs no, um, are going to be under threat. So even under the Duterte, for example, uh, DSWD and DLG have been asking NGOs and CSOs to register. Uh, donors have had to submit lists of who they fund and what they fund. no. And so uh, it's all well and good uh, if it's just you know your kosher relief goods, but what if it's something um, else? But even then, no, uh, the smallest thing uh, can be taken against you. So ito yung mga klaseng uh, problema na hinaharap at itapusapan ngayon. Especially now that we're, we're now facing uh, not only the shrinking civil space, but also uh, increasingly difficult fiscal space. Um, people are now talking about how we have ex an extremely high uh, debt to GDP ratio. We'll mm -hmm. be facing uh, extreme austerity at a time when more uh, public spending and engagement is needed. No, uh, And so this is all in an environment where you have the incoming uh, spokesperson saying that everything, including history, is up for debate. So yun, um, yun yung mga classing crisis conversations. Uh, um, Ika, a quick follow-up uh, before I turn to Vince. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, no uh, uh, conclusions yet, but what are some of the answers to that question? How uh, do you get uh, civil society to uh, become civil again? What are some of the answers that are being tested? <laughs> right now? Uh, no, no real answers yet, but more questions then. Eh? Uh, and a follow-up question will be, how do you heal yung broken relationships between people? Um, and maybe it's not possible at the grand scale yet, but even just with your neighbor, at the neighborhood level, how do you engage that? How do you make sure that your neighbor of a different color does not throw excrement <laughs> at your house because you're of a different color? Uh, how do you make sure that, uh, uh, looking at the drug bar, for example, how do you make sure that when uh, a, neighborhood, uh, an, a neighborhood person who happens to be branded so-and-so is killed violently, how do you make sure that you are still able to mourn with that person? Mm -hmm. and condole with their family without being afraid of being branded as, a, as someone associated with that. No? So it's being able to stop at a fundamental level the polarization of society, starting with the neighborhood. And we can talk more about that. Uh, Vince, how about you? Uh, what are some of the conversations that you're part of uh, like? Well, I, I think uh, as far as the conversations I've been involved with, uh, it's really about... Uh, girding uh, ourselves for, well, excuse the metaphor, for, for, for battle. I think uh, a lot of civil society organizations believe that it's going to be a tougher environment uh, under which we will be operating uh, with Marcos Jr. And, and we know that the past six years has sort of been, unfortunately, a training ground uh, for, for many civil society organizations, for, for many people, for many individuals who have been through the martial law years, and we're talking about people who are uh, in excess of 40 years old, uh, this environment is not completely foreign or new. Mm -hmm. uh, for the younger generation, maybe maybe for, for Ike's generation, I don't know how, how young Ike is, but uh, for those who aren't as uh, familiar with the terrain um, uh, under a, a an administration that, that we believe would probably have uh, fascist and authoritarian tendencies, uh, the battle widens now. The battlefront now widens. It's not only about uh, pushing for legislation or, or working on policy reform. Mm -hmm. It is now about, again, uh, taking to the streets, perhaps, um, and finding other forms of, of protest and resistance and uh, different ways to, to promote the advocacy. So, of course, uh, 
people like myself and, and, and those who are of a certain generation, uh, the battle fronts are different now. Uh, they are not all uh, what they were in the 70s and 80s. Now the battlefronts are primarily online. But as Aika points out, a lot of online battles have spilled out into the real world. And so whereas perhaps in, in, in the first Marcos uh, administration, uh, you're really doing battle with state forces. You, you're worried about the uh, uh, PCI, uh, PCINP and, and the AFP. Mm -hmm. But now you, as, as Aika points out, now you do battle with supporters out in the, out in the, in the real world who are uh, not shy to put the excrement on your, on your tarpaulin. Um, and so it's, it's a completely different world than it was uh, 40 years ago. And so even, even we have to rethink about where, how to, to engage and how to, how to do battle in, in this new world. Um, so it, it, it's, it, it requires a lot of, I think, uh, reflection and uh, uh, thinking about how we're going to engage this new the second Marcos uh, presidency. Um, and I think we all agree it's not going to be easy. Um, it's, it's definitely not going to be easy. Yes, Vince, um, how can... Um, uh, it, it might be premature to ask, but... Um, is it possible to speak already of silver linings? Uh... <laughs> I'm still in the anger stage, John. <laughs> no, silver linings. Uh, but, but, but I do yeah, sense right. a lot of movement, right? I mean, there's 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 a lot of activity. Yeah. Uh, perhaps yeah. the activity itself is the uh, uh, is the is uh, its own reason for for being. People are just doing stuff. But I, I do see a lot of movement going on in different uh, sectors, people trying to come together, people trying to organize, uh, well, uh, get yeah, together. A, 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 cu a couple of things, John, I mean, come to mind. One is that although uh, Marcos did get the 31 million, um, his, his main uh, opposition got quite a, a diehard army of volunteers. Mm -hmm. And while we cannot rely on all of those to become active volunteers in the, for the next six years. Uh, there are a core of people, uh, individuals that uh, are dedicated to, to defending democracy and, and making sure that the second Marcus presidency isn't near the repeat of, of the first. Um, so that, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, the alliance, the Marcus alliance right now is, from my understanding of it, and we have to talk to political scientists about this, but it's, it's a bit of a fragile alliance. And as early as now, I mean, they haven't even taken uh, their seats in Marañang. Uh, as early as now, we're hearing that uh, there is already some internal strife. Um, and, and that, I think, is uh, for us who are fighting for reforms, I think is a good thing because it would be difficult to, to fight the united front. Um, and so if there's internal fighting and bickering, uh, that distracts them and, and that weakens them. Uh, to to a certain extent, and that that makes it a little easier for us. Not a whole lot easier, but but uh, a little bit easier. Um, and so I, I don't know if those are silver linings, um, and, and maybe it is too early to be thinking about silver linings. But um, certainly, uh, it it is never as gloomy as we initially think it is, um, and right now it looks pretty gloomy. Uh, but we will find opportunities. I think uh, as things evolve, we haven't seen the full cabinet yet, uh, so we don't know what that looks like. Um, and of course, we also have to consider the global context um, and, and how that might uh, play a role uh, in local uh, politics as well and the local situation. So um, it's a little too early, I think, but mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, they'll make their appearance at, at some point. Ika, I don't know if you know personally uh... Uh, people like R.C. Balisakan, the incoming economic planning secretary, or Toots Ople, who in her own right uh, is also a figure in civil society and is the incoming secretary of the uh, Department of Migrant Workers. Um, I have a question for you. Um, if you know someone in civil society comes to you and says, there's actually an opportunity for me to work in the Mar second Marcos administration, what do you say? I have had those conversations oh, with okay. people uh, who are in society. Who have been asked. 
<laughs> we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> but what do you say? What I told them was um, very few people are given the opportunity to help. Uh, and by help, I mean um, being able to bridge, being able to protect what needs to be protected, and to move the needle forward you know, in, in a time where uh, any president, not just Marcos Jr., Jr., will be having um, a major you know, uh, challenge keeping the Philippines afloat. So, yun ang sabi ko sa kanila, um, hindi, hindi masama na tumulong. And um, people, you know, like Toots and others, you know, who are CSOs na, na, um, who have been asked to step up, people do know also that given their track records, it's, you know, <laughs> they will be doing their jobs with a critical eye, a critical mind, you no, know, and will be looking out for uh, for the best of the Filipino. Ang problema lang dito, syempre, is syempre, fear ng iba, it will legitimize something which people others, uh, people also see as illegitimate. So it's a tension um, right. that has to be decided by individuals themselves. Are, not, are they ready and willing to make that sacrifice? Uh, the thing is, though, we also know that other presidents have done this tactic that they will appoint good people for the first year, mm-hmm. di ba? And then change them after year one with their own lackeys and people who will do damage, no? But either way, if you can um, uh, do what Dinky Suleiman and others call yung crossover, bakit hindi? Yeah, although I think uh, what the second Marcos administration uh, is doing is uh, they, they are actually appointing two kinds of uh, uh, cabinet yeah. secretaries. So you have, you have the ones like R.C. Balisaka and Tuts Ople, on the one hand, but also you have, you know, people like uh, Erwin Tulfo as DSWD secretary uh, yeah. uh, or Trixie Angeles as PCOO. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it, it's like, it's actually, it seems to me like there are two kinds of uh, agenda at work here. Uh, Absolutely. And they will be working at cross purposes. You cannot uh, do the reforms you need fiscally, no, uh, if you don't have a good team uh, to handle the SWD and, and uh, the other ministries. Uh, Vince, and then Ika, uh, what should we watch out for? I mean, some developments perhaps in the next, uh, uh, okay, maybe in the next 30 days until uh, he takes his oath. Um, we should watch out for, you know, red flags or, I don't know, silver linings. I think his his I think his victory is the red flag. <laughs> I think uh, well, I mean, in terms of, of red flags, I mean, of course, when you look at his cabinet appointments, it's everyone always looks uh, to, to the critical ones. Which, so the economic team. So you've got R.C. Balisak and there, you've got uh, Ben Jokno as, as finance secretary, and uh, whatever you say about uh, Ben Jokno, um, he's he's. Uh, more, more, I guess, a, a technocrat than, than, than anything. Um, but at least uh, it's not a Erwin Tofu type of appointment at the Department of Finance. So as far as the economic team is concerned, it seems to be shaping up very well. And, and I think most incoming administrations, whether it's, it's a second Marcos or any, uh, are very cognizant of the importance of the economic team because that is what the international community is looking at. They're looking at is the economy going to get messed up and all of that? So, so I think as far as that's concerned, uh, Marcos Jr. is following uh, what is what happens in, in most uh, administrations when they come in. Now, how that will uh, play out over the six years of his administration, uh, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, and then, as you point out, John, you've got uh, appointments like like Erwin Tufo at the DSWD, where he uh, has, uh, in my opinion, absolutely no business. Um, being in the DSWD, he has no background in it. He, he doesn't have the, the understanding of, of, of the complex problems that face the DSWD. Um, so there are uh, political accommodations. And I, I expect there will be more and more political accommodations in, in the appointment. And again, this is not unique to, to Marcos Jr. Um, we've seen that in administration after administration. Um, but how bad will those political appointments be? I mean, if we take a look at for example, the GMA years. I mean, uh, in her first half of her term, uh, she was making generally well-regarded uh, appointments. And after the high of 10, it was a matter of political survival. And then her appointments went downhill. Uh, for me, what I'm looking for, what, what are sort of red flags to me, and then I can already see what's going to come down the pipeline. 
are the key appointments to all uh, independent constitutional commission. So uh, the commission appointments bypass uh, some of Duterte's appointments, which means it's now up to President Marcos. I don't want to say that too prem prematurely. The incoming president mm -hmm. uh, to uh, then appoint uh, those people, to, to Kamalek and others. So uh, for me, those are the uh, critical appointments that we have to watch. And I haven't been following the Supreme Court, so I don't know when the next vacancies are at the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court appointments as well. Uh, sometime, I think in the next two or three years, the ombudsman is set to retire. That appointment is also very uh, critical. Um, so for me, those are the kinds of things I'd be looking out for. And then, of course, uh, DND, PNP. Uh, those would be very important as well. Uh, Ika, yeah. Ika, we're uh, uh, running short of time, so maybe I'll move on to the next question. Um, maybe I can ask you the main question I asked at the start of the show. Uh, again, we're not looking for definite answers yet, uh, but what role uh, can civil society play under a second Marcos administration? Actually, that answers two questions, no? both the role and also the silver lining. Mm -hmm. um, sabi ng mga iba, no, ang Pilipino, parang FPJ, gusto mo na magpapagbog, di ba? And so uh, this kind of uh, impetus, no, this is massive reality check is uh, a trigger for for engagement for CSOs and, and even you know, the uh, the non-organized but nevertheless important emerging groups such as K-pop stands uh, and uh, viber groups of of um, motorcycle riders these guys are important I'm not kidding no and, and they will I suspect they will uh, form a new face uh, of civil society engagement in the years to come. Mm -hmm. um, Vince mentioned I think partially yung yung pink movement the pink uh, groups no and to be honest, these uh, non-CSO, uh, you know, not not non-NGO, but nevertheless mm -hmm. organized uh, groups, uh, played a big role in that. You had uh, groups from uh, drivers for Lenny. You had <laughs> uh, Guapo for Lenny, no, and, and you had uh, um, these identity-based uh, groupings that that were able to to form the backbone of, of what is uh, uh, surprisingly. Uh, interesting and strong uh, opposition run. So in terms of what could be done, I think it's going towards that direction. Siyempre, mm -hmm. what you're talking about is uh, towards Marcos and his cabinet, sure. But mm -hmm. um, what I'm personally keen about to see is few more localized forms of engagement. Mm -hmm. And this is something which we saw not only during the elections, but even during the pandemic with the community pantries, you had a rise of Gcash-driven mutual aid uh, initiatives. Uh, you had pop-up guerrilla bicycle lanes, no? And this is not new per se. Filipinos are fond of bayanihan, damayan, di ba? And, and sa mga Muslims, you have yung sadaka, no? Charity. So, uh, I think this is also a crossroads for CSOs to reimagine what they can be um, going beyond the professionalized NGO that honestly has its own faults and uh, reimagining how you can engage um, and invite more people to, to work. And so, although we did mention that, you know, uh, See, uh, civil society is something that's outside the market. Even the market itself uh, can be a potent force for engagement. Um, being able to to shape policy uh, with your spending, with your uh, donations, with what you choose to to finance, no. So, uh, oh, this is something that's going to be interesting. Lalo na now that, for example, CSOs are worried about um, uh, being blacklisted by government. It's it's not something possible. Uh, people are worried that. Uh, CSOs who are affiliate, not affiliated with uh, the administration uh, will not be allowed to work the same way uh, they have. Um, sure, but if we're able to harness the non-traditional CSO networks, and that is something uh, that I think will be interesting in the years to come. Yes, we can even think of uh, some of the more active civil society leaders uh, going into politics and, uh, and, you know, and thereby also uh, laying claim to the third sector. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're out of time. There, there are so many things to, to discuss. I mean, this is just the start of a conversation, actually. Uh, you know, the beer should start flowing at around this point. <laughs> we haven't even talked about, uh, like, the possible role. Of, you, you, you adverted to this uh, uh, very quickly, Ika. But the possible role of an Angat Buhay NGO, uh, how, how that can galvanize the uh, si uh, civil society, uh, mm -hmm. or how it can also be a source of uh, uh, risk uh, for civil society. But again, we're out of time. Um, 
maybe we'll have another conversation like this uh, in private or in public. <laughs> um, but for now, um, Ika Fernandez, Vincent Nazatin, thank you very much for your time, your insights, uh, and for helping illuminate the public square. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for us tonight. The next step for engaged citizens is always to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night.